All righty. Well, this evening we're, going, of course, looking at the next passage in, in the Gospel of Luke. I've already told you what this is about, so let me just go ahead and uh, read it. Verses 57, this is Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. As for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Well, may the Lord bless uh, his word to our understanding this evening. Now, remember this morning, Jesus uh, told us, he showed us what our attitude should be toward those that that wrong us toward those who offend us. Remember the Samaritans of a particular village turned Jesus away, turned his disciples away because they were traveling towards Jerusalem. Uh, again, the, the debate between them and, and just the offense of, of the Jews or the, of the Samaritans toward the Jews because of this contention between where was the right place to worship, what is the true worship of God. James and John's response, remember, was to ask Jesus' permission to call down fire from heaven to destroy them, just as Elijah did the prophets of Baal. But instead of giving them this permission, Jesus rebuked them instead. He rebuked them because vengeance belongs to the Lord. He will repay. We need to leave those matters, the matters of justice, in the hands of God but remember, they also completely misunderstood what it is that Jesus had come to do. It's kind of strange, but we're reminded the disciples didn't always catch on right away, and neither do we, you know, as far as what the Lord desires of us. Jesus did not come to destroy or to judge mankind, but rather He came to save them. This was the time of mercy, and today is still the day of mercy. We know that God has always delighted in mercy but now He has revealed it much more fully uh, in His Son. And so our response really needs to be that of the Good Samaritan, who when he saw his enemy in need cared for him rather than putting him out of his misery. We are to show mercy in the hopes that the Lord might change the hearts of others. And of course, as I've said before, leave the righting of wrongs in the hands of the Lord. He will take care of it. Now, this evening, Jesus challenges us again, and I just want to remind us again that His challenges are always for our good. Jesus was not malicious. He wasn't raising the bar beyond what it needed to be when He spoke to these three men, but He was telling them things they needed to hear. Everything that Jesus says is gracious, and it's meant graciously, and it's something we need to hear, and it's always for our good. Now, He challenges us here by asking three questions to us really, challenging us in three different areas regarding our own discipleship through these encounters with these three individuals. And basically, these are the three challenges. Have we counted the cost of discipleship? Have we made this discipleship following Jesus and His priorities, have we made those our priorities? And are we serving Him with an undivided heart? I believe that that is really what's behind these three challenges. Now, first of all, have we counted the cost? Let me just reread again the first encounter in, in Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 58. Luke writes, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So as they're traveling, someone comes to Jesus whose heart seems to be full, you know, full of desire, full of excitement, full of love for the Lord, right? Full of conviction that Jesus is the Messiah and He wants to follow Him. He's full of enthusiasm to serve Him and He expresses this desire to follow Jesus wherever He goes. Now we know that it is a good thing to be enthusiastic 
uh, especially when it comes to the things of the Lord. That's what the love, the Spirit of God actually places in our hearts, should create in our hearts enthusiasm, zeal for the Lord's glory. But we also need to recognize, as Jesus did, that not all enthusiasm necessarily comes from that love as its source. Uh, remember the, the parable of the sower and the seed that basically sprung up and looked so promising but withered away uh, because of the heat of the trial. Well, we might say that uh, Jesus here is sort of preheating things to see whether or not this man has what it takes uh, to follow him. Now, we know that Jesus always received everyone who came to him. You know, he, um, and, but, but when they came to him, he never necessarily accepted them at face value. Jesus always tested them to see what it was that was motivating them. Um, and I think more accurately, to show them what was motivating them. And again, think about this as a pretest. Now, that's what he does here. He tests this man to see if he had counted the cost of following Jesus and was willing to pay it. Or basically, if his desire to follow him was just a momentary impulse that would fade with the first difficulties that he had to face. And so Jesus says to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I think in essence what Jesus was saying to him was this, that you know, God has, has graciously provided to all of his creatures a place of their own. But I don't have such a place, not even so much as a place to lay my head, a bed to call my own, and neither will you if you follow me. There is a cost. You can count on sleeping often under the stars or being dependent on those who are gracious enough to offer us hospitality as we travel around. Now, are you willing to follow me under those conditions? Are you willing to pay the price. Now, we do need to understand that what Jesus is dealing with here might be considered more of a call to missionary work than maybe to the average believer or disciple because not everybody who believed in Jesus necessarily followed him around. Those who were called to the mission field, they understand that it's going to, be, it's going to mean hardship, right? It's not necessarily uh, going to have everything that other people might have. They may very likely not even have a place to call their own. Some do, and most don't, I think. Uh, to, my, to my knowledge, the, um, the Robins uh, likely don't maintain a house in the States while they're living and ministering in Uganda. I think they've thrown all of their chips in, haven't they? When they come to the States, they are pretty much dependent upon uh, the hospitality of the church to meet their needs. And I think pretty much the same thing is true for most of our full-time missionaries, if not all of them. But we also need to remember that since we are all called to be missionaries, we might say with a small m, that there is a sense in which what Jesus is saying to this man also applies to us. Now, I would imagine that we pretty much all have our places uh, to stay and we all have our beds. Uh, when Jesus calls us to follow him, it doesn't necessarily mean that we uh, liquidate all of our possessions in order to follow him. But we also recognize at the same time that the Lord is the Lord of everything that belongs to us. And he has given to us everything he has as a stewardship. And if the Lord should call us to do so, as we're going to see in the quote at the end of this uh, sermon, either in, in part or, or in whole, if he calls us to give what we have to him for whatever reason, we need to be willing to let go of that thing, whatever it may be. That's what we actually committed to do when we took up our Lord's cross. Jesus will say to us at the end, no one of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Isn't that what he challenged the rich young ruler with? Remember the idea that um, uh, one thing you lack, sell all that you have and give to the poor. And the reason why he did that was because he realized the possessions had possession of the rich young ruler. It was his God. It needed to go. Sometimes the Lord will call us to do it. He doesn't often do that. But this reminds us that we do need to use everything that the Lord has given to us for his glory. 
not just to meet our own particular needs, and the Lord does give us these things to do that, but also the needs of His kingdom. The work can't go on without the Lord's people sacrificing. And the question is, are we willing to do this? Did we count the cost before we answered the call of our Lord Jesus Christ to follow Him? Many people do it impulsively. And again, that's what uh, the stony or the stony ground hearer is all about. They, uh, they answer Jesus. They look very promising. They're very excited. But when the costs begin to fall due, they fall away from the Lord because they didn't really love Him. If we would follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we must be willing to pay the price, whatever it is He calls us to pay. And the good news is, of course, we will pay that price. We are willing to pay that price because the Lord has made us willing by His grace. This is not a work we do to earn heaven. This is something Jesus does through us. We need to recognize He has given us the power to do it and the desire if we belong to Him. Now, the second question is, have we made the Lord our priority? Luke continues in verses 59 through 56. And he, that is Jesus, said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, first permit me or permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Now notice in the first case, somebody came up to Jesus and offered to follow him. In the second case, Jesus comes to someone and calls him to follow him. And as is in the first case, this is a call to discipleship with a view to, looks like full-time work, go everywhere and proclaim uh, the kingdom. But notice here, when Jesus called him, he had an excuse as to why he couldn't follow Jesus, at least not right away. And the reason was because he had a duty to perform yet. He had to go and bury his father. Now, many commentators, as they study this passage, believe that this man was actually saying to Jesus that his father was still alive, but duty basically dictates that he needed to stay at home until his father passed away, and then he buried him, and then he would come and follow him. And this seems likely to be the case because... Um, if his father had already died, then he'd be at home burying him, or this would have been something he had already done. Now, the point here is this man seemed to have a legitimate excuse because what he was saying was, I'll do it, Jesus, but I have this duty, a duty that the Lord actually calls me to do. Now, the question here is, what if we're faced with a situation that forces us to choose between two duties? What Jesus is saying here is we need to make him our priority. We need to do what is most important. There is a hierarchy of responsibility. Jesus said to this man, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying there are other people who can bury your father. Uh, let the dead bury their dead. You go and preach the gospel. Now, one question we might ask here is, what does Jesus mean when he says, allow the dead to bury their own dead? I mean, if somebody's dead, they can't bury somebody who's dead, right? Well, they can't if they're physically dead. But what Jesus obviously means is that there are those who are spiritually dead. This man should leave that work to those who are spiritually dead because they could do the work just as well as he could but they couldn't do the work that Jesus was calling this man to do because he was spiritually alive. Now, as our Lord's disciples, we do need to make sure that we don't let other things, even the things that are our duty to do, crowd out the things that are more important, okay? the things that Jesus mainly wants us to do. Now, sadly, that's that's actually often what happens in our lives, and we need to guard against it. Jesus, for instance, wants us to read our Bibles so that we will know what it is that he wants us to do. But again, how many times have we set aside time for some serious Bible study and reading only to have it interrupted 
by the thoughts of all the things that we have to do that day, all the other things that are left undone, and the impulses to go and do those things, and we end up doing those things instead of really what it is we need to do. Instead of doing the most important thing, the thought comes to mind. Remember when uh, Mary and Martha were ministering to Jesus and Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet and Martha was doing all these other things she thought was important and she got upset with Mary and said, Lord, why aren't you telling Mary to help me? And Jesus said, she's chosen the better part, you know. She's doing really what she needs to be doing. You shouldn't be so worried about these other things. And that's exactly, I think, what we end up doing. Well, Jesus also wants us to pray. He wants us to pray for the advancement of his kingdom through the work of evangelism and missions. And you know what? That work isn't going to advance if God's people are not praying. As I said in my prayer, I don't know if you remember or heard this, the Lord could advance things without our prayers. He doesn't need our prayers, but he wants us to pray. He wants us to pray and desire these things and to ask him continuously that he would advance these things. But how many times have we done that? How many times have we tried to do this only to have basically the same thing that happens with our Bible study happen in our prayers? You know, we think of all the other things we have to do so we don't get down to praying. Or if we actually do get down to praying, to have our minds flooded with the thoughts of what we need for the things that concern us, people that we know who are in need, perhaps, um, again, uh, that are legitimate needs, right? But not the most important things. So we end up praying the second part of the Lord's Prayer rather than the first part. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We end up praying, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. And we pray for those things that, that concern us rather than the things that are primarily on the heart of our Lord. Now, we need to put the most important things first. Jesus also wants us to evangelize because no one is going to be saved without hearing the gospel. But how often, again, do we find things, even things that we're commanded to do, getting in the way? As a matter of fact, our flesh is going to find every excuse under the sun to keep us from doing that one thing because that is the most important thing. Well, Jesus tells us that we need to put the other things aside. Other, other people could perhaps take care of those things, and we need to get down to doing the most important things. And we need to do it for several reasons. We need to do it for his sake, right? Because his kingdom, his reward depends on the work that we do our understanding his word, our, pr our prayers, our evangelism. Because the, the, you know, the well-being of others also depends on our doing this work. Their salvation depends on it. And we need to do it for our own sake because our reward actually also depends on these things. Now again, Jesus has given us his Holy Spirit so that we will put his priorities first, but again, we need to recognize we have two desires, two sets of desires in our hearts, a desire to do what the Lord calls us to do and a desire not to do what he calls us to do, but rather to do things that well, the world might be drawn us out to do, things that seem perhaps even things that are okay, that are just more fun than what the Lord calls us to do. We need to yield to the Spirit, and we need to do that realizing, too, that as we do, we will experience a greater joy and pleasure in doing those things than anything that we might do in this world. Remember we talked about the hidden manna uh, the Lord found in, in his serving his father. We can really feast on that same thing as we give our lives to the Lord. Now the final challenge comes in, the, in that last encounter and the challenge is are we serving him with an undivided heart? In verses 61 and 62. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, here's somebody else who volunteered to follow Jesus, but also someone who had something else he needed to do first. He wanted to return home. He wanted to say his goodbyes. 
Now, this is really like the previous person, only this seems like it would take much less time than waiting for your father to die. Now, on the surface, it doesn't seem to be an unreasonable request, does it, to go say goodbye to those at home? Uh, remember when Elijah came to Elisha and he, he basically called him, and Elisha said, let me first go say goodbye to my father and mother, and then I'll follow you. And Elijah said, go ahead, go do it. And he did, and he followed Elijah. There's nothing wrong with saying goodbye, but it appears from what Jesus says to him that there was something more going on behind this request. When he says, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God, Jesus discerned in this man that he was having a difficult time letting go, letting go of his family letting go of the things that he should let go of. His heart was divided, okay? Now, the Lord is not telling us through this example that we necessarily need to give up our families, obviously, because they're a part of us. We are to care for them, right? And we'll always love them. We are not absolutely to give up our families, although sometimes, again, the gospel might cause a division within the household, and, and that is difficult. But I think the Lord is telling us here that at least for us, there may be times when serving Jesus means that we'll have to leave them for a time, right? I mean, Peter was married. Sometimes we don't get that impression when we look at the Gospels, but we do know that Peter's mother-in-law was sick and Jesus laid his hands on her and healed her, which means that Peter was married, which means that Peter had to leave his wife oftentimes as he was following Jesus. There were, he, had, he had to give that up. Uh, although we understand he still had to provide for her somehow in the interim and made sure that, that she was okay and perhaps any children she had. And, and the same may have been true of the other disciples. There may be times when we have to leave our families for one reason or another. But there are things also that we must give up when we follow Jesus' call, not just family, but anything that might divide our hearts. And perhaps one of these is the expectation that we can follow Jesus and basically have everything else that we want out of this world at the same time. You know, there's, there are actually movements in the church that promote this kind of thinking, you know, the abundant life, the victorious life, the health and wealth gospel. You can have it all. You can have all the world, everything that you want to fulfill your desires, and you can follow Jesus at the same time. But I don't think... That's what we can do. Following Jesus means that we do need to give up certain things. It means we need to give up the world. And Jesus is saying if we can't let go of those things, then we really can't follow Jesus. Now, remember what we saw at the very beginning with regard to Lot's wife. Wasn't that ultimately her problem? The angels told Lot to take his wife and his, his daughters and son-in-laws and get out of the city, and he said, run, flee, and do not look back. And Lot's wife looked back. Why did she look back? Did she want to see the destruction that was going on? No, it's because in her heart she turned back to Sodom because she loved what was there. Sodom was the world. She loved the world. Her heart was divided. She couldn't give it up. And because she turned back, well, she fell under the same judgment that Sodom and Gomorrah fell under. Jesus told his disciples when judgment came upon Jerusalem that they were to flee and not look back. And then he reminded them what happened to Lot's wife. If they hesitated, they would get caught in that judgment, which means Jesus was telling them, don't have a divided heart. Don't worry about what's back there. You need to get out of the city. You need to keep moving ahead. Well, Jesus told this man that if he couldn't make the commitment to follow him with his whole heart, he was not fit for the kingdom of heaven. The idea of a plowman putting your hand to the plow and looking back, you're not going to steer a straight course. You're going to end up hitting things you shouldn't be hitting. You need to be looking ahead. You can't be looking continually back as you're plowing. In the same way, if you're going to plow in the kingdom of heaven, you need to keep looking forward. If you can't make that commitment, Jesus says you're not fit, you're not suitable, you're not usable in the kingdom. And really, our Lord is telling us the same thing. This is the cost of discipleship, isn't it? We cannot serve the Lord with a divided heart. He tells us that really throughout the Scriptures. We can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. Jesus says, you cannot serve two masters, right? Because you'll either 
love one and hate the other or cling to the one and despise the other. You can't love both. You can't have both. Jesus says he must have it all. He must have all of our devotion. He must have an undivided heart. We must give it all to him. So really, it's, it's all or nothing, essentially. We need to give it all to the Lord. Crucifixion means the whole man, a whole offering. Remember how Paul says, offer yourself up as a whole burnt offering, as, as a living sacrifice. Not just, don't just put your arm on there, not just your, you know, your hand. The whole person, we need to give ourselves. If we died, we died wholly to this world, and we have been raised with the Lord Jesus now to serve him as those who belong exclusively to him. And again, that's what the Spirit of God has given us the ability to do. He's given us that kind of love and that kind of devotion. But we do need to nurture it, don't we? And that requires time in the Word, time in prayer, and yielding to the Spirit of God. Now, in closing, I want, I want us to see that Jesus actually addresses a teaching like this indiscriminately to whoever was following him. On one occasion, he, he basically turns to the crowd and he expresses the same thing, perhaps in, in other words, and it's actually in Luke's gospel as well, so we're going to get to this again eventually when we get to Luke chapter 14. But let me go ahead and read it for you now just to show us again that this is not isolated teaching. Luke 14, verses 25 through 35. Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Therefore, salt is good. But if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear let him hear. Now again, Jesus is describing, in, in somewhat other words, the same things we just saw, what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a Christian. Because what, what are Christians? The word itself means little Christ, one who is like Christ. And who is it that we're called Christians? The disciples. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch, which means a Christian is a disciple. So this is what it means, counting the cost and being willing to pay it, making Jesus and his kingdom the priority, and serving him with an undivided heart. And really, remember again that this is the beauty of the gospel, what we cannot do in and of ourselves. If the Lord said, do this and you will live, we'd all fail. We'd all perish. But the Lord says, look to me, look to Jesus, okay, and I will give you the ability to do this. This is what the Lord gives us the ability to do by His Holy Spirit and by His grace. So we need to look to Him in order for the strength, the power to do what He calls us to do. Well, let's bow, shall we, for a moment of prayer and, and let's ask the Lord to help us do this.